Hi everyone, this is Reverend David Saki, and uh, thanks for joining me today. I just want to just share with us some very powerful verses that I was reading as I was having my quiet time. Really, really powerful. I pray that God is uh, blessing you guys, taking you guys to higher levels. I pray that many people will be having their testimonies, 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 testimonies. Amen. Because they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimonies. So let's share with a prayer. Father God, speak to us. May none of us live the same. In Jesus' name, Yeshua Amashiach's name we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. Right, so let's read this. Very, very powerful. I'll read this uh, in the King James and then the NLT. The Bible says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good, for thy good. This is Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13. And when you read the rest of it up till verse 22, it's very, very powerful. But let me read it in the NLT. And now Israel, I'll just read verse 12 in the NLT. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. Wow. And of course, you and I are the Israel of God, according to Galatians 6.16. You and I, if we are, we are children of God, we have faith in Jesus Christ. We are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. So this is awesome. Now, the Bible is saying that what God requires only is to fear God. And of course, to fear God doesn't mean to fear in terror. It means to fear God, to stand in awe of God, to reverence God. So the Lord requires us to fear and or reverence him, to stand in awe of him. The second is to live in a way that pleases God. Very important. And then to love God, to serve God with all our heart and soul. And then to keep his commandments. And of course, Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my commandments. Hallelujah. So this is what the Lord requires of us. And I, I believe this is powerful because if you think about it, God created us. If you read Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So you and I were created for God's pleasure. You and I must live our lives to glorify and to please the Lord. Hallelujah. So these are things that God requires. I, I feel that if we are able to do what he requires, he is going to be pleased with us. Amen. And then let's also turn to Ecclesiastes. This is very important. One of the very, very important verses in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. And I'll just read from 13 to 14, but it's verse 13 we are looking for. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now, Solomon is someone who has achieved what you and I are looking for. Is it achievement in terms of status? Is it someone who has achieved, I mean, whatever he set his heart to do and his mind to do, he achieved? That is Solomon. Solomon was someone who said, I want to build a vineyard. He built it. I want a project to, 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 to do great things in the land. I want to build houses. I want to build office blocks. I want to do this. Whatever he purposed to do, he did. And he was the most successful man in the world at that time. Hallelujah. Now, this is someone who has done everything we want to do, has experienced everything we, want, we, we, we can experience, or at least most things. And the Bible calls him the wisest man. He, he was so wise that he was the wisest man on earth. Of course, Jesus Christ is wisdom. But Solomon, as a human being, was the wisest man on earth. So if the, uh, the wisest man on earth is telling you and I something, we must believe it. 
If someone who has failed in something is telling me something, I don't know whether I'll believe it. There's someone I know who, when I was in high school, he was teaching me mathematics, teaching me advanced level math. He was teaching me and I was very diligent in attending his class because I loved math and I wanted to excel in math. Then he got his advanced level results and got an F in math. As soon as he got an F in math, I stopped attending the class. There was no point in attending the class of someone who has gotten an F in mathematics. Hallelujah. In the same way, someone who has filled in something, what's the point of listening to them? But Solomon is someone who has done everything, has achieved. Now verse 13 says, Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God or reverence God or be in awe of God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Then verse 14 goes on, the last point verse, he says that, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad or evil. So you and I, we must always remember that God will bring every secret thing to judgment. So I pray that my secret things and your secret things would be good things. Remember that from what this verse is saying, the, the, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there are evil secret things and there are good secret things. Jesus said, do your good things in secret so that your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So I pray that the evil deeds that people do in secret, that we do in secret, we must stop doing those evil deeds and then do good deeds that are done in secret. Hallelujah. And also openly. And God will bless us. But it's verse 13. The whole duty of man. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God or love God and keep his commandments. Fear God and love God. Keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. And the Bible says that you and I were created for his pleasure. So now let's go and let, let, let's, let's deal with each and every one of these issues. So fear God. To stand in awe of God, reverence God. Now, let's deal with each and everything that God is requiring of us. The first is that we must fear God. Now, what does it mean to fear God? It means to reverence God. If you and I reverence God, we will reverence His word. If you and I reverence God, whatever His word says is, a, a, is, is, is a, 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 how do I say, a warning, we will take it very seriously. Whatever God's word says is, is, is something that we must take very seriously. We will take it very seriously. Whatever God's word says, we would reverence it. We will stand in awe of it. We will be careful as to what we do because God sees everything. Everything you and I do, God sees it. God sees the bad things you and I do. We are not supposed to do any bad things. So let's say God sees the things that we do. Some of the, the sins we commit in our hearts. Sometimes people are prideful in their hearts. Sometimes people are unforgiving in their hearts. Sometimes people hate in their hearts. Sometimes people have all sorts of jealousy, envy in their hearts. God is a jealous God, but his, God, his jealousy is pure and true and, 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 and righteous. But human beings, our jealousy leads to trouble. Strive, envy. The Bible says envy brings all sorts of evil work. So you and I, Whatever it is, if you are, we are, we are doing, we, we have sins or secret sins, things that are not pleasing God, we must fear him knowing that he sees our hearts. He sees what is in our hearts and, and, and what our motives are. Some people do very good things with the wrong motives. Some people are in church and are laboring in church, but with the wrong motives. Some people give to charities with the wrong motives. Whatever our motives are, we must make, remember that God sees everything we do. To fear God is to reverence God, is to reverence his word, and to remember that God is watching every single thing we do. So if we are doing evil, or we are in sin, or we are living in sin, or whatever things we are doing that we know are not pleasing God, let's try our best. Pray to God. Tell God that you cannot do it yourself. There are some of us who are struggling. There are things that I've also struggled with in the past that you are struggling to, to, to whether it's fear, whether it's anxiety, whatever it is, whether it's doubt. There are many things people are, 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 are doing. Are doubt, there are many doubts, many things people are doing that don't bring glory to God. And, because, and, and we must remember that God sees it. So pray to God, God, you know my heart. Search my heart. 
You know what is in my heart. And I pray, oh God, that you would remove everything in me that is not right. And I know I cannot do it myself, but you are the one I'm relying on to help me. And God will do that. So very, very important. Let's fear God. Then also, we must live in a way that pleases God. Now, it's very clear in the Bible what pleases God. What are the things that please God? The things that please God are the things that he tells us pleases him. How do I know what pleases God? All I need to do is to read the Bible and find out what people did that pleased God. You realize that the Bible says, and this, this thing that David did pleased the Lord. Or this thing that David did displeased the Lord. Or this thing that this prophet did pleased the Lord. This thing that this king did pleased the Lord. You also see what Jesus, what pleased Jesus. There are certain things that people did. You realize that anytime you walk in faith, you please God. Whatever we do, that, 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 that is of faith. That, that, that is of faith, pleases God. So let's find out from the Bible the things to do that please God. You realize that when we sacrifice for God, when we do something that costs us for God, or we think about ways to, to please God, it pleases him. Now look at David. The Bible says that David said to himself, God is so great. I know that God doesn't need to dwell in a house, but let me do this thing for God. Let me build God a house because I don't want us to be carrying this, tab this tabernacle and, 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 and the ark and all, the, you know, just moving around the ark all over the place. You know, I want to build a house for God so that his presence, the ark of the covenant can rest there. Let me do this thing for God. Now I'm going to tell my pastor Nathan that this is what I want to do for God. And I pray that God will accept it. The Bible says that it pleased the Lord. The Bible says that Solomon, after he sacrificed to God, he, 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 he did a great sacrifice to God. After sacrificing to God, God asked him in a dream, Solomon, what do you want me to do for you? That also taught me that any time we do a something great for God, we sacrifice for God, it, it, it generates or it provokes the opportunity to be blessed. Anytime there's a sacrifice, it provokes the opportunity to be blessed because sacrifice is better than obedience. Heaven sees sacrifice. When you sacrifice greatly to please God, heaven sees it as great love. So Solomon said, God, I don't want anything but wisdom and an under understanding heart to go in and out from among your people and to judge this great nation. This is what I want from you, O oh God. And God said, wow, because you did not ask for the life of your enemies, because you did not ask for riches, because you did not ask for any other mm -hmm. thing, but you asked for something that concerns me, I am so pleased with you and I'm going to give you this wisdom and knowledge and I'll give you so many riches that you've, you, you've never even comprehended. So you can clearly see the things that please God. Anytime we do something or we sacrifice for God to, 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 to prove his word or we do something that his word says pleases him, he is pleased. And any time you please the Lord, God is looking for something to bless you with. I, 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 hallelujah to Jesus. Similar to a parent. Any time a parent sees that the child has pleased the parent, or any time a child pleases a parent, the next thing the parent wants to do is to do something to please the child. Any time a parent is pleased, the child provokes a blessing. Hallelujah. And anytime someone tells you, even if you are not planning to do something and someone tells you that, you, wow, you know what, I'm planning to do, I, I, I thank you for doing this thing for me. Or let me say it in another, another way. Let's assume I am planning to, I'm not planning to give my child a thousand dollars, but I have more than enough. But my child thought that, I, I wrote something to my child, maybe I wrote a text to my child, that child... I want to give cousin Joe a thousand dollars. What do you think? And maybe the child misread it. And the child is thanking you and is so appreciative of you giving them a thousand dollars, even if you don't, did not intend to do it. It will provoke you to give it to them because they are so appreciative. Also, anytime 
your child or someone believes that you can do something, you want to do it to, to, because they, they've provoked a certain uh, uh, ability to do something for, uh, uh, for yourself, if that makes sense. So anytime someone believes in you that you can do something, it provokes you to do it. In the same way, if you and I believe God, believe his word, God tells us that, look, all things are impossible, that anytime there's an impossibility, he specializes in impossibilities and he's going to bless us because all things are possible with God. With men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It provokes a blessing. That's why anytime people were, trying, were, were, were acting in faith, Jesus acted. When Jesus was around, was around the Greek woman who, whose daughter was vexed with the devil, Jesus was not planning to heal the daughter. But the woman's faith provoked the healing. Praise the Lord. Anytime there is faith, it provokes pleasure from God and it pleases God. We all know from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Similar to when Jesus told his mother, Mother, I know this is the first wedding, but I am not planning, it is not my time for a miracle. The woman, Jesus' mother said, whatever he tells you to do, do. Jesus said, fill all the jars, all the jars of wine, fill them with water and serve it to the governor of the feast. They acted in faith and received a blessing. We know it, and I'll repeat it again. Hebrews eleven six says, For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Meaning that 0.0% .0 probability of pleasing, pleasing God, pleasing God, if you don't have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, verse 2, or the second point, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we please God by believing that God exists and that he rewards the diligent seeker of him. Now, who are the diligent seekers? Those who seek God by praying to God. Those who seek God by reading his word. I'm seeking God. That's why I'm trying to read my Bible every day. He seeks God and he reads the word of God daily. He prays daily and he decides to follow the word. He decides, decides to touch God's heart. Those are the people who please God. Then the next way to the next thing that God requires is to love God. Oh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's turn to it. Verse 4 and 5. By Deuteronomy 6, 5. Oh, yes. This is one of the key verses in the Bible, which clearly shows that we serve one God. Not multiple gods, but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Or another version will say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Or the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. And this one is one God. Hallelujah. Then verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Hallelujah to Jesus. So we are going through each of them. And this is my quiet time that blessed me. And I feel that it's going to bless somebody. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 22. Now let's start from verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them which was a lawyer or lawyer of the scriptures, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Which of the, the commandments is the greatest commandment in the law? Which one is it? Jesus said unto them, the greatest commandment, meaning that better than anything you and I can do in this life, the greatest commandment that you and I will be judged by, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great or greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang 
or support all the law and the prophets. What a blessing. What a blessing. So Jesus made it very clear that the greatest commandment is to love God. Now we love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our might or strength. You read it that Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5. And I'll read Deuteronomy 6.5 again. It's clear that it is, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might or strength. So you and I must love God with all our heart from the innermost being. Love God with our spirits. Love God with the cryptos man, the Greek word which means the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. Love God with all your heart. God is a spirit and seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. God is seeking for such. Love him with all your heart. Love him with all your emotions. When you love your spouse, when you love a beloved, Jacob loved Rachel and he proved it with his might. But you love someone with your heart, you think about the person in your soul. Think about the person, want to know about the person. You can't tell me you love someone and you don't want to know about the person. How can it be? How can you say you love your spouse or you love your beloved, you love your, your fiancé and you don't want to know about them? All you need to know is about their name and everything is about you. Everything is about me, myself, and I. You don't let them talk. All you need to do, all you do is you just tell them about, your, about yourself. Everything is about you. You don't love them. If you are like that and you have a beloved or you have a, a fiancé who is, who is self-centered, nothing about you but only about them, be careful of them. Now, that's not how God wants to be loved. God wants us to love us, love him with our hearts, with our minds. You think about him. Think about our God. Read about our God. Study about our God. And with our strength, it means that you must, you, you must have, you, you must love him with your strength. You must toil. You must be tired for God. You must, you, you must, you, you must be weary. Or when I say weary, you must, you must spend time, energy, exert energy. Someone will say, exert energy now. You must exert energy and, and strength. In loving God, it means that in loving God, you must prove it by what you do for the person. Because if someone says they love me and are not willing to do, I don't believe it. If my spouse says I love you but I'm not willing to do what pleases you, I don't believe it. And if I love my spouse, I must be able to do what pleases them. You can't tell me you love your fiancé, you love your spouse. I'm using fiancé because when you are, you, you, you are in love with your fiancé, ah, oh, my fiancé, oh, my beloved, oh, I don't know what to do, goosebumps, I love that. But unfortunately, when people get married, they start to, it starts to dwindle. But let, let that not be your story. In 50 years' time, when you are married for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, may the love continue to blossom even more than it was before. Hallelujah. But when you are with your beloved, you would not t believe it when they say, I love you, and yet the things that are dear to you, they don't want to do it. If something is dear to God, you do it. It means you will love your neighbor. It means you will help people. It means you will serve him. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, the next one is to serve God with all your heart and soul. And then... To keep his commandments. Now Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my commandments. If a man does not keep my commandments, it proves he does not love him. Jesus said it. Of course, what is his commandment? Jesus said in John chapter 13. Hallelujah to Jesus. I don't know what I'm preaching to somebody about. I'm preaching you happy here. John chapter 13 verse 34 and 35. A new commandment, Jesus said. I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved to one another. If you summarize all the commandments in the Old Testament, they are summarized into ten commandments. Now, when you take all the ten commandments, they are summarized into love God and love your neighbor. Romans 8. I'm not talking about love. Love is a very powerful topic which I'm sure I'll share another time. But, sorry, Romans 13. I'll just read that and then we will move on to uh, uh, the next one. Romans 8, uh, Romans 13, 8 and 9. 
Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So instead of worrying this commandment, that commandment, do I need to follow this? Do I need to follow that? Too much. Too much. You are, in, you are don't get into the law. The Bible says that if you are in the law, then you are falling from grace. Forget the law. When I say forget the law, it doesn't mean don't obey the word of God. When, when I say forget the law, there are many laws. Don't hold me on that. What I mean by that is that forget obeying ordinances, rules. You commit this sin, take a death turtle dove. You do this sacrifice this you do that sacrifice this too much all you need to do is to love god and love your neighbor and you fulfill the law because love does not work any ill to his neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law hallelujah so we keep his commandments by loving god and loving our neighbor that's it hallelujah now finally serve god with all your heart and soul it's in the bible so we have to accept it 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Last point. Well, last point, and then I will talk about some of the benefits of loving and serving God, which is a blessing. Now, it means that anyone who loves and serves God must expect God to fulfill these, fulfill these things. Has to. Has to. Expect God to do the things that you would hear shortly. Because God said it and his word is true. His word will not be broken by any by him or by anyone. First Corinthians 15, 58. But before we get to 58, let's look at from verse 52 so that we can get the context of verse 58. Are you ready? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? What the Bible is saying is that in the last day when the trump of God comes and Christ comes before the, uh, uh, um, he comes uh, finally, when he comes during the rapture, what will happen is that you and I, who are Christians, would have put on immortality, meaning that we would have our glorified bodies and death will be swallowed up in victory. What does it mean? It means we cannot die any longer. It means that death, we would have won the battle over death. Because Jesus Christ took the keys of death and Hades, hell. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? You and I will be able to boast and say, death, we've defeated you. Death, you are swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. We'll go into this another time. But the sting of death is sin. Meaning that it is because we sin that we will die. But the strength of sin is the law. Meaning that it is the law that shows that we have sinned and we should die because of the law. We'll talk, uh, maybe another time. Verse 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because of the resurrection... Because we will resurrect one day in our glorified bodies. Because we will have perpetuity, perpetuity, meaning that life, infinity, world without end, infinite, infinite life. Meaning that 10 trillion trillion years is like a second which begins again. Infinity, boundless, timeless when we are in infinity. Because of all that, we must remember that we have a short life and a long eternity. Therefore, my beloved brethren, verse 58, be ye steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain. Glory to God in the Lord. I repeat that again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse. Hallelujah. Now, very important. Now, let's look at some, some of the keywords. Now, that's why it's very good to have a concordance, strong, exhaustive, con exhaustive concordance, or use the Bible hub, which I use, and that's why I got these. Now, to be steadfast, what is the Greek meaning of to be steadfast? Now, this will be found in the uh, 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 concordance 1476, Hedreos, meaning steadfast, which means steadfast and firm in purpose, morally fixed, well stationed, not given to fluctuate, fluctuations or moving of course. So to be steadfast is to stay on course, not to be given to fluctuate fluctuations, but to be fixed, to be stationary. You and I must be steadfast, stay on course. What is our course? Our course is that we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, and we must live for Jesus. That is our goal. That is our duty as Christians. We're, we are born again Christians and our duty is to love God, to fear God, to keep his commandments. Therefore, we must be steadfast in all that. Be steadfast in your decision to be a Christian. Be steadfast in your decision not to go back to, uh, to the world. Be steadfast in your decision to, to live for Jesus and to live off sin, to live away from sin. Oh, to live away from sin does not mean that you not fall short. To live away from sin does not mean that you not forget to, or you, 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 you will not fall short in lies. To be steadfast and, and live for Jesus does not mean that you will not make the mistake of lying, or you will not make the mistake of fornication, or you will not make the mistake of what? What again? Uh, gossip or slander or hate, unforgiveness, the list goes on. But it means that to be steadfast means that you go back on course and you say to yourself, I'm going to do it. God has given me the strength. He's delivered me from sin. So I'm going to live without lying. I'm going to live without fornication. I'm going to live. Oh, but I've slept again. No problem. Rejoice not my enemy. Oh, glory to God. I say rejoice not my enemy for if I fall, I will rise. So you rise up again and you continue in faith. That is what mm -hmm. we are talking about. That is steadfastness. Steadfastness means I've decided to follow Jesus and I'm staying on course no matter what happens. Un immovable, immovable, unmovable. Now, what does it mean to be unmovable? It means immovable, firm, without movement, without change. So you and I must not let circumstances move us. Do not allow circumstances to move you. Do not allow circumstances or painful experiences or troubling events to move you. Move you from what? From your decision to serve Jesus. From your decision to love Jesus. From your decision to serve God in your church and in every way. Do not allow any circumstances to affect your stability in Jesus. To affect your stability in church. To affect your stability in the things of God. The word of God was there before the problems came and will still remain after the problems have gone. Look, for example, at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Am I preaching to somebody? Very, very important. Romans 8, 35. I'll read from 35 to 39. Beautiful. Beautiful. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation... So, what can separate you and I from the love of Christ? Number one. Number two, what would Christ allow us to experience? 
that would intentionally cause us to leave him. Let me say it in another, in another way. Do you think Jesus Christ, after dying for us, do you think he would allow tribulation, trouble, or problems to take us away? Do you think he gave us, he, or he allowed troubles to come to us so that we will leave him? No. He, gave, he allowed troubles and tribulations to affect us, to rather strengthen us, but not to take us away from him. Therefore, we must be unmovable. Let's see what I'm talking about. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Or distress? No. Or persecution? No. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or peril? No. You've lost your job. That is not, God did not allow that so that you leave him. Distress. God will not allow distress so that we will leave him. No. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is one of the best verses you can read. For I am persuaded that neither death for those who died in the Lord, nor life, if you are afraid, you are about to die. You are about to die. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, no matter how high it is, nor depth, no matter how deep under the earth it is, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are covered, you are, you are, you, you are, you are secure. You are secure for God has hidden you and I in Christ or with Christ. We are hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Look also at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I don't know that I'm preaching to somebody here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Very, very important. What's the point of knowing how to get certain things? Isn't it better? Yeah, what's the point of knowing how to get certain things? It's a great importance. It's very important to know what God says we must do to get what we are looking for. If there is a formula, do X and you get Y. Why shouldn't I know it? Why shouldn't you know it? The more we know the things we need to do to get what we are looking for, the better it will be for us. Now, God has not made it vague. He's made it very simple. Do certain things and get certain rewards. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. Whatever it is, everything is for my sake and for your sake. All things, all things, all things, all things, all things are for my sake and your sake. And that is... The abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, rebound to the glory of God. Hallelujah. When people give thanks to God because of our good works and the things that God does in our lives, they will give glory to God. Verse 16. For which cause we faint not. Because of these things we do not give up. But though our outward man perisheth or perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us or worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Don't worry about what is happening in your life. Don't worry about the painful things. Don't worry about the difficult things. Be unmovable because it is a light affliction according to God, not me. I didn't say that. For our light affliction, which will work a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Then it goes on to talk about, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And it goes on. Hallelujah. So you and I, no matter what happens, be unmovable. Be immovable. My advice to you is to be immovable, 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 immovable. I'm not moving. I'm not moving. 
Even if I'm about to die, as for God, I know that he is going to, he, he's the one who I deal with. Before I was born, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you and I called you. Before I was born, now and when I die, it is only God I'll deal with. So what he says matters. Anything that has to do with God is what matters. Ladies and gentlemen, very, very important. So, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, what does it mean to abound? To abound means to be over and above. So, to be over and above in the work of the Lord. Exceeding, exceed the ordinary. So you and I must exceed the ordinary, the status quo, when it comes to the work of God. Abound, overflow. Go beyond the expected measure. Above and beyond. What goes further? Surpass. Always abound. Always abounding. Always abounding. But it means that there will be times that you don't feel like abounding. But always abounding. I said there will be times that you don't feel like abounding. There are times that you don't feel like doing anything for God. Then you and I must remember that it is the mercy of God that even gives us the grace to even do something for God. Because God has called us to a great banquet, to a great feast. He has called us to a privilege to work with him. I mean, imagine you are co-workers with God. Co-workers with God. That's why Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Take it that anything you do for God is because of God's mercy. So I want to encourage you, be steadfast in what you are doing with God. In your decision to serve God. In your decision to be a Christian. In your decision to be a good Christian. I remember... Long ago, when I was a new convert, Prophet Kakra, um, we met in, the, in London, in the UK church. He said, David, be a good Christian. Just be a good Christian. The decision to be a good Christian, be steadfast in it. Many of us should say to ourselves, I have decided from today that from today, I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm going to be a good Christian, not just a Christian, but a good Christian. From today, be steadfast. Unmovable. Don't let anything move you from what you are doing for God, from your church. Don't let anything move you from your church. Yes, don't let anything move you from your church. Don't let anything move you from attending church. Now, someone will say, come on. Sometimes I need to just bend and wallow. In my misery. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Hebrews 10 25 says, Not forsake, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of psalmist. Be unmovable in terms of your church attendance. Because if you think about it, those who are good Christians, I don't need to tell them about this. If you are a good Christian, you go to church. If you're not a good Christian, you will not go to church. Now, a good Christian who is serving God, who is living for God, let's, uh, 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 I'm, not, I'm not talking to you. Oh, I'm talking to you because you might, you need to be unmovable. It means that certain things will try to move you. But I'm also talking to those who don't go to church. Now, if you don't go to church, remember that throughout the week, God, isn't God that important that throughout the week you give a day to him? Just a day. Just a day to God. For two hours. Right now, we are, we are, I mean, we are doing a, a, a church online. That's even easier. Two hours. Now, when we start church, that is when you need to even show your devotion even more. Only two hours. I'm not, I'm not even talking about weekday. You're not even coming for Sunday. Let's even wait for the center meetings, center meetings. Let's even wait on that. Just to attend church once a week. 
if you are a good Christian, it will not be difficult for you to say to yourself that from today, I'm not, I will decide to go to church. I'm not going to church for the pastor. When I go to church, I'm not going for the pastor. When I'm serving God in the church, I'm not serving God because of the pastor. I'm not, I'm not an usher because of the pastor. Because the pastor is serving God himself. How can I be serving God? I mean, how can I be serving the pastor? You are serving God and not the pastor. Anytime you serve, even if you are serving your pastor, it's God you are serving. You are serving God through your pastor. So from now on, make it a point to be unmovable when it comes to church. Make it your point to be unmovable when it comes to the things you are doing for God. Whatever you are doing for God, don't let circumstances move you. Hallelujah. Always abounding. It means that abound. Look for things to do. Look at, I'm saying it, yes, look for things to do because you are to go above and beyond the work of the Lord. What can I do for God? God, what can I do for you? Be desperate. Be praying about it because God is telling us to abound always in the things of God, in the work of God because your labor in the Lord is is not in vain. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. Hallelujah. Now, finally, what are some of the rewards? There are many rewards, but for time's sake, I'll just give us a few. What are some of the rewards of serving and loving God? Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, I'll start with that. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which he have showed toward his name in that he have ministered to the saints and do minister. Now, if the Bible says that God will not forget your work, it means that whatever we are doing for God, we are doing for him. So it means that when you work for God, God takes it personally. Wow, David has pleased me. David has worked for me. I'll not forget what he has done for me. I'll not forget it. That's what it means. If you want to touch God's heart, and you want you don't want to for, you don't want God to forget what you've done for him, then make sure you work for him because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Remember, make sure the name Jesus is attached to it. Because for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which he have showed toward his name. Remember that. And also remember Hezekiah. Hezekiah worked for God. When it was time for him to die, he reminded God that God have saved you. I built an altar for you. I built a church for you. And then God said to the prophet, go and tell Hezekiah that I heard his prayer that he is not going to die. So sometimes working for God can prolong your life. Keep the reason and you would prolong the season. Hallelujah. Number two, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon, we know this verse. All of us know it. I'll be shocked if you don't know it. If you don't know it, it's not a problem. It's not a crime, but I'll be surprised. If you don't know it, now you know it. But many people miss a certain part of it. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Oh, hallelujah, we all know this. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Hey, we all know it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. That's where there's a separation. You cannot confirm or confess boldly this verse if you're not a servant of God. There is something that has been sent against you. Hey, the Bible says, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Every time that rises up against me in judgment, I will condemn. And you are not serving God. I, I, I don't know how it fulfills because you are changing the word of God. That's not what God said. God said, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Now let me do something very important here. Let me, hopefully this would not waste my time. Let me read it. Uh, Isaiah, I'm reading it in a few trans translations. I'm going to Bible.hub. Am I preaching to somebody? Isaiah 54, 
17. Isaiah 54. Now in verse 17, I can have different translations. New Living Translation. But in that, but in that, in, but in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I am the Lord. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wow, let me repeat it. This is beautiful. But in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wow. New Living Translation I just read. These benefits. These benefits. What a blessing. So if you are a servant of God, it is a benefit. And God will not change his word for anything. If you are a servant of God, indeed no weapon that is formed against you can prosper. It is not possible. It is impossible to prosper. It is impossible. Someone will say, it is impossible now. It is impossible to prosper now. It cannot prosper anything. An accusation, a word sent against you, a, a, a weapon sent against you cannot prosper if you are a servant of the, God because, of the Lord because God said, said it. Then he says that their righteousness is of me. So another hint too is that the Christian, that saves God because Jesus is our righteousness. And the, the Christian is righteous and has been justified by faith. So the Christian that saves God, no weapon can ever succeed. Can ever succeed because they are servants of God. Hallelujah. That, that's powerful. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed by that. Romans 8, 28. We all know this verse. This is another verse that, unfortunately, I wish it could, but it, it won't hold for everyone. Like I said, don't just read it because, you see, when a pastor is preaching, don't, don't just take it because the pastor said it. Read it for yourself and see if they are missing a piece. Because if a pastor says, hey, no weapon, those that shall form against you shall prosper. Every time that rises up against you in judgment, you condemn. Hey, and everybody's shouting. Yes, it's good, but you miss out on that verse because the pastor didn't finish it. He didn't finish it. He didn't say that these are the benefits of the servants of God. So it's very important. That's what the Bible says in Acts that the saints that were at Berea became more noble or more mature or better Christians than those that were at Thessalonica. Why? Because after they, they received the word with readiness and after hearing the word, they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether what the apostles or what the people said was true. So it means that when you hear preaching, you, 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 you understand it better and become better at it when you've gone to the scriptures that were given. That's why it's good to take notes and then search it to find out whether there's more to it. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Everybody hears it and starts clapping. Oh, my problem. Yes, God has heard it. It's going to work together for my good. I sympathize with you, but the Bible, I'm not the Bible. I sympathize with you and I pray that all will be well. But if you are going to use this verse, then let's continue. To them that love God, to them who are the called or servants of God, the called according to his purpose. Let's read it in another translation. You see, if we are real and honest with ourselves, we will get the benefits of God. But not knowing or ignorance of what God said will not give you what you are looking for. Even if you didn't know. That's why the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for 
the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, let me do something here very important. I hope this is blessing you. I'm going to the Amplified Version. Hallelujah! When you're having a quiet time, it's always good to get different translations. Very good. Amplified. And we know with confidence, with great confidence, that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. So, oh God, thank you that all things are working together for my good. Yes, this thing happened. You see, God is gracious and he would eventually make things work together for our good. But realize that this verse says that, and we know that all, if you are not a servant of God, I can't speak for you because I, I, I don't use my own words. I, I don't, when I'm preaching or I'm speaking to someone, what I think about or my thoughts don't count. Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, I'm preaching. Some of the things sound too, too much for me. And, I, and anytime I'm trying to minimize what God is saying or trying to say something to make it nicer, I correct myself. So let's not do that. Now, the Bible is saying all things. So it means that for the Christian who it loves God, and you don't say, I love God by just saying it. You love him with all your heart, soul, strength. I talked about it earlier on. Now, who loves God and who is called? Now, come on. We all know that when the Bible says you are called, it means you are serving God. That's what it means. You are called. It means you are serving God. There's no time to go into that now. But maybe another time. Or just read a very, very, very good book I recommend by our prophet Bishop Dag Heward Mills. Now, some of us might not know him, but Dag Heward Mills. Many are called. The book is called Many Are Called. Many Are Called. Get that book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on a website. But very, very good book. When you read that, you will, there are so many verses that clearly explain what it means to be called. So let's not even go there. Hallelujah. So every Christian who loves God and is called, God would make everything work together for your good. Whether it's a mistake, whether it is good, whether it is bad, actually that's what he says, whether it be good or bad, whether it be good or bad, whatever it is, the Bible sees it in many ways, whatever it is, God will cause all things, whether good or bad, all things will work together for my good. It means that even if I made a mistake, even if I went wrong, I remember a relative asked me, I was about to make a move for God or do something for God and he asked me, what if you are wrong? What if what you are doing God didn't say it. And I said, it is possible. I believe God said it. But even if it's wrong, God will honor my mistake because I thought I was doing it for God. And I thought God told me to do it. So even if I'm wrong, God will honor it. And oh, I believe it was God's will. But even if it wasn't, God honored it and he honored it real good. What was it? Even my move to Minnesota, my move to Minnesota to start a church, that, that was it. I was asked that question. And at least souls have been won. Churches have been planted, so it clearly means that it was God's will. At least God honored it. But if I even made a mistake, I fell into sin, or I did something wrong, and I repented, but I'm loving God, and I am working to, and, 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 and I'm called. Remember that I said I repented, not that I'm living in it, sin. But I repented. God will make Everything worked together for my good. Even the sin, God will turn it around and work, uh, use it for my good. How? By letting me see the wrongs of it. By letting me encourage others not to do that sin. Or whatever God has in store. Based on this verse. Now, if you are someone who doesn't love God. Or who loves God but you are not called. Or you are not working according to your calling. What would happen? Some things will work together for your good because you are a Christian. But 